Greetings family, this is Yudha Yasharel. Welcome to the channel and another lesson on part two of why Jesus cannot be the Messiah, the Roman lie. I keep doing this because I'm noticing more and more Christians that are opening their eyes and starting to see what we've been trying to show for the longest time. They're starting to become aware of the indoctrination, how it was done, which is the purpose for this second part of why Jesus cannot be the Messiah. <clears throat> In this lesson, I am pulling scriptures from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what I'm going to try to attempt to do is show you the Old Testament scripture and the New Testament scripture which was used to justify the prophecy of JC. And I'm really hoping that you'll be able to spot these things because if you're just an avid a less than an, an avid reader, it's easy to overlook this stuff. And I believe they, they counted on that. So I want to try to open this thing up where you can see. And, and hopefully there are people who are still in Christianity that just might, just might wake up. But nevertheless, I will give it my best shot. <clears throat> Part two, the New Testament case. The uh, unidentified writers of the Gospels wanted to prove that J.C. was the long-awaited Messiah. They were not historians and did not claim to be eyewitnesses of the events that they narrated. Their aim was to prove that prophecies made in the Old Testament were fulfilled in J.C. Now, every one of these prophecies have been taken out of context or distorted to make them fit their chosen candidate. <clears throat> now, y'all, for y'all that don't know, the Romans, the Pisos, the Flavans, uh, the Caesars, they went in together and they did a lot of backdating. And uh, a couple of years ago, I did some research on the Romans backdating. And this was a common thing. And this is how they were manipulating their New Testament JC to uh, look authentic. And you got to give them credit. That was very clever. And they were very good at it. <clears throat> but they backdated these things to the years that would make the prophecy be more realistic. And I can't go into details on that because it's a long, drawn-out process. I did do a lesson on that in my old channel, which when I deleted that channel, I didn't think to, uh, to save a lot of my lessons. So, you know, it's... It's gone. But for those readers who do not have the time and patience to cross-check for themselves, I'm giving all the text here. <clears throat> now, these are the alleged prophecies fulfilled in J.C., or allegedly fulfilled. Number one, born of a virgin. Okay, we're going to use Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And we're going to use Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. And it reads, <clears throat> Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us, 
All right. <coughs> so now let's look at <coughs> Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Now you really got to watch this closely. And this is a long lesson. I was thinking of breaking it up into another part so it would be part uh, part three, but uh, it's kind of hard to just not put all this in here. So we've got over 7,208 words here. So let's look at Isaiah chapter seven and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a son Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Now, this is a tricky part, so I really want y'all to focus on these words. So let me read Isaiah 7 and 14 again. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, I broke this down into context. Hopefully this will open it up pretty wide so you can see what I'm trying to point out. So now let's look at the context. <clears throat> this is a fairly famous prophecy. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of y'all know this one, which the New Testament claims was fulfilled in the birth of J.C. to Mary, a virgin. In fact, an examination of the context of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 will quickly reveal that it was not intended to be a Masonic prophecy at all. The first point to note is that Isaiah did not use the word virgin. Y'all getting this? Isaiah did not use the word virgin in his prophecy. He actually used the Hebrew word Alma, which simply indicates a young woman. This word means young woman. Now, actually, there is one case in the Bible <coughs> where Alma is used to refer to an adulteress. All right. Please pay attention. It was in Proverbs 30. Verse 19 to 20. And it reads, The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a young woman, Alma. Okay? This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. If she is an adulteress, then how could this Alma be a virgin? Now, the Hebrew word for uh, adulteress is Bethula. <clears throat> now, since an adulteress cannot be a virgin, then this word Alma cannot refer to a virgin except in the Christian dictionaries. Y'all going to see how they twisted and bent and manipulated the scriptures to make their claim authentic. The RSV correctly translates Isaiah 7 and 14 as therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign behold a young woman shall conceive and bear a son now up here remember it says that Right here. <clears throat> now, right here it says, it shall bring forth a son. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, right here. 
It says, Behold, this is in Matthew, a virgin shall be with child. All right, see how it used the word virgin. Now that's what we grew up being taught. But this is what it said. This is what it said. <clears throat> Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive. It did not say virgin. A young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, the New Jerusalem Bible also correctly translates Isaiah 7, 14 as the Lord will give you a sign. In any case, it is this. The young woman is with child and will give birth to a son whom she will call Emmanuel. Now, if Isaiah really intended to unambiguously designate the woman as sexually pure, which would be virgin, he would have used the word bethula, which does, which does denote a sexually pure woman. Actually, Isaiah did use this word in chapter 23, verse 12, where he refers to the virgin daughter of Zion. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, mistranslated Isaiah 7:14 with the Greek word parthenos which does mean virgin it seems that the author of Matthew used this Greek scripture and did not realize that this is a translation error if Matthew were really inspired by the Holy Spirit then he would have not made this mistake now, in chapter 7, Isaiah introduces a child with the name of Manuel. This name means God is with us. <clears throat> and Isaiah used it in the sense of God is on our side. That's what his intentions were. To predict that the alliance between Syria and Israel formed against Judah. Chapter 7 and verse 1. The alliance would fail. In fact, Isaiah even put a time limit on his prophecy in verse 16. He states that before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Jews put the age of accountability at about eight years. So we may therefore assume that Isaiah expected his prediction to be fulfilled within this time limit. It is also not clear that Isaiah's prophecy came true. I don't agree with that. Second Chronicles 28 seems to indicate that Azah <coughs> was indeed defeated by the kings of Israel in Syria. Summary, Isaiah does not refer to a virgin, nor does he expect his prophecy to be fulfilled centuries in the future. He gave his son at a specific time for a specific purpose. That epoch had long since passed by the time Matthew thought to use Isaiah out of context to lend credibility to his case for J.C. being the Messiah. Also, for, for fulfilling that prophecy, if it were a prophecy, J.C. was never named Emmanuel. Y'all know that, right? <clears throat> J.C. was never named Emmanuel. His name was Yehoshua after his uncle. Later, this degenerated into Yeshua, then Yeshu, slaughter of the innocents. Now, this is how I broke these uh, sections up. 
Our title, Slaughter of the Innocents. All right, this is going to be in Matthew <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 17. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. <clears throat> According to the time, he had diligently inquired of the wise men, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Now, let's look at Jeremiah <clears throat> chapter 31 and verse 15. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, or Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. Now, here's the context. This verse is part of a long diatribe, diatribe by the prophet Jeremiah, and there is no mention of it pertaining to any specific event or appearance of the predicted Messiah. The Jews have been the most embattled people throughout history, and Jewish women have frequently wept for their children from the time of Abraham. <clears throat> this alleged prophecy is so general as it to be worthless in terms of scriptural proof of some specific occurrence like the slaughter of innocent children by Herod. This horrendous disaster remains unrecorded in any Jewish or contemporary literature of the time. Surely an act of such wicked magnitude would have been recorded somewhere by contemporary historians. <clears throat> now, born in Bethlehem, reference to Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Let's start with Matthew, chapter 2, verse 6. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Messiah should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem. Y'all remember this. In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now, watch what John says. Has not the scripture said that Messiah comes of the seed of David? Remember this. And out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was. Now, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, thought thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, here's the context. The New Testament claims that J.C. was born in Bethlehem, right? In fulfillment of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, <clears throat> in order to judge the accuracy of this claim, we need to establish two facts. First is this, in fact, what Micah prophesied, and secondly, was Jesus actually born in Bethlehem? The Messianic interpretation is partly correct. Michael sees a king once more on the throne of Israel, a king moreover descended from the line of David. And it is this that gives us a clue to the interpretation of Micah 5 and 2. The phrase Bethlehem Ephrata is a reference not only to the town of Bethlehem, but also to the clan of Eprata, which was based in that town. 
So it is quite unlikely that Micah 5 and 2 refers backwards to the origins of the Davidic line, which the prophet then sees stretching forward into eternity. Now the Bible makes it clear that it was David himself who was born in Bethlehem of the clan of Ephrata. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 12. A second <clears throat> but related possibility is that Micah was referring not to the town of Bethlehem but rather to the man Bethlehem, the grandson of Caleb by his wife Ephrata. So can y'all see how this was manipulated? So, <clears throat> moving on. In this context, the phrase Bethlehem Ephrata refers to the clan from which David sprang, not specifically a geographic location. In addition, the word translated thousands is elsewhere used in the sense of clans. Joshua chapter 22 and verse 30. Most modern versions translate this phrase in Micah as though you are little among the clans, which means thousands of Judah, if we assume that Micah was in fact referring to David as the originator of the royal line, how are we to understand the phrase, whose goings forth have been from of old? from everlasting. This is most likely a reference to the fact that the Davidic house was established centuries in the past. From the perspective of the author, Micah may also be referring to the fact that the Jews understood the Davidic line to be the fulfillment of several promises made by God to the patriarchs. So it seems that Micah 5 and 2 is in fact a prediction of the restoration of the royal Davidic line, the line which originated in Bethlehem of the clan of Ephrata. If, as many claim, this is in fact a prophecy of J.C., it has to be asked at what time was J.C. a ruler in Israel? Ask yourself that question. At what time was J.C. ever a ruler in Israel? Obviously, he never was a ruler in his lifetime. We know that's a fact. Christians tend to claim that this part of the verse has yet to be fulfilled and will come to pass in the future kingdom of God when Christ rules over all the world. Now, the logical flaw presents in this reasoning is that claiming a future fulfillment automatically invalidates the prophecy, since obviously it has not yet come to pass, and there is no assurance that it will. Micah 5 and 2, therefore, remains unfulfilled prediction from the Christian point of view. The second point that needs to be established is whether Jesus was in fact born in Bethlehem. This may seem like a very strange question to a Christian to whom the answer is self-evident, but it is in fact a valid concern. Of all the books of the New Testament, only two of the Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, record the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Paul never once refers to this fact. Even though it would have strengthened his claim that J.C. was a descendant of David, which they use Romans 1 and 3. The Gospels of Mark and John also never recorded that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. John even asserts that those who knew Jesus and his family knew for certain that he was born in where? Galilee. Y'all getting this? Now, John 7 and 41, we're going to do uh, verse 43. <clears throat> others said, he is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Y'all should be asking that same question. 
Does not the scripture say that the Messiah will come from the David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of this Jesus. John 7 and 28. But we know where this man is from. Y'all listen to what John just said now. But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then J.C., still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I'm from. That's J.C. talking, y'all. The people did not believe that J.C. was born in Bethlehem and knew that he is from Galilee. Let me highlight that. He is from Galilee. They were divided because of this. The priests were certain that he came from Galilee. John 7 and 52, they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Not one of them. The priests knew for certain that J.C. came from Galilee, not from Bethlehem. Christians will often counter that these people were simply mistaken in their belief that J.C. was born in Galilee. However, it seems strange that not even the author of John even bothered to correct their perception for the benefit of his own readers. Further, J.C. himself confirmed in 7 and 28 that their knowledge of his origin was correct. He says, yes. You know me, and you know where I'm from. What about the birth narratives of Matthew and Luke? A careful examination of these two stories will quickly reveal that they are completely different. Matthew begins with Joseph and Mary living in a house in Bethlehem where Jesus was supposed to be born. Following the threats of Herod, Joseph supposedly fled to Egypt with his family and remained there until Herod died. Now, upon learning that Herod's son reigned in his place, Joseph decided not to return to Bethlehem, but instead took his family to Nazareth. Now, Luke, on the other hand, begins his story with Mary and Joseph living in Nazareth in order to comply with a Roman census, Joseph takes the pregnant Mary to Bethlehem where Jesus was born in a barn as there was no room at the local inn. Following the birth, Joseph took his family to the temple in Jerusalem and then returned to his home in Nazareth. It should be obvious that the only point that these two stories have in common is that they both claim that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Aside from that, all the characters and events in these two stories are completely different. They are even set 10 years apart in chronology. Matthew states that Jesus was born when Herod was still alive, no later than 3 or 4 BC. Luke states that Jesus was born when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, which did not take place until at least 10 years after Herod's death. How did we miss that? This raises the suspicion that these birth narratives were in fact concocted simply to bolster the claim that Jesus was the promised Messiah in accordance with the Christian understanding of Micah 5, 2 through 28. Now, this is the summary. This prophecy fails on two counts. We cannot be sure that Micah intended his prediction to mean that a future king would be born in Bethlehem, and we also cannot cert certain, be certain that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We have further seen that parts of Micah 5 and 2 remain unfulfilled, according to the Christian interpretation. Now, Called out of Egypt. We're going to use Hosea and Matthew. We're going to start with Matthew. When he arose, he took the young child 
and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Now let's see what Hosea said. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Does this ring a bell, people? Who is the son that was called out of Egypt? That was the Exodus. It was Israel. The Most High delivered Israel from Egypt. That's what this is referring to. Context. We, let's look at the context. Matthew is the only evangelist to use Hosea 11 and 1 as a Masonic prophecy and with good reason. It is hard to find a more blatant misuse of an Old Testament passage anywhere in the Christian Bible. The very verse quoted by Matthew quickly establishes that Hosea never intended this verse as a Masonic prophecy. It is, in fact, a remembrance of the time when the people of Israel were brought out of Egypt by God. It has nothing to do with a coming Messiah. It also has not been established that Jesus ever spent any time in Egypt. Matthew is the only New Testament writer to record this incident and his chronology contradicts that of Luke's, who states that Joseph took his family back to Nazareth no more than 50 days after Jesus was born and never mentions any Egyptian sojourn. How about that? So they went immediately after the birth to Egypt or returned to Galilee after 50 days. They could not have done both so either one is a fabrication or they both are. It appears that we have here one more example of Matthew making up events in Jesus, in Jesus' life to conform to his own perception of Old Testament prophecy. Now, let's look at the ministry in Galilee. We're going to use Isaiah and Matthew. Starting with Matthew. With Matthew. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias, the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death light is sprung up. Now, Isaiah 9 and 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be, such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously affect, afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They, they that dwell in, that, in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Now, let's put that in context. In order to judge the accuracy of this prophecy, we must once again look at the source passage in its historical context. Isaiah places this prophecy in the days of King Ahaz of Judah and King Pekah of Israel, which would have been between 732 and 734 BCE. At this time, the Assyrian king Tigla Pileser Pali Pali attacked the outlying northern cities of Israel and took captives back to Assyria. 2 Kings 15 and verse 29. 
In the days of Pekah, king of Israel came to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ion and Abel Beth Makkah, Abel Beth Makkah, and Jonah, and Kadesh, and Hazar, and Gilead, and, Gil Gal and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. With this background in mind, it is not difficult to see what Isaiah was talking about in chapter 9. The first section of this chapter predicts the re reunification of the Davidic kingdom. Isaiah foresees the restoration of the outlining parts of Israel to the kingdom, 9 and 4, and the reestablishment of the royal line of David over the United Kingdom. Isaiah speaks of this ideal king in 9 and 6. Another passage that is a favorite of Christians, apologist, although it was never used as such by any of the New Testament writers, which is true, what is true is that the titles applied to the ideal king in 9 and 6 are similar to honor, honorific titles of the Egyptian kings. Although Isaiah did not give a time limit to this prophecy, we should note that no king of the line of David has ever ruled over a united Israel since the days of Solomon. How did we miss this? If this passage does, in fact, apply to J.C., as Christians insist, we might ask at what point he restored Galilee to the Davidic kingdom. Now, he's entering Jerusalem on a donkey. Everybody's familiar with that. If this one don't get you, nothing will. Zechariah. We're going to use Zechariah and we're going to use Matthew. And I want y'all to listen carefully. All this was done that it might, this is Matthew. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a coat. Now, I want to stop and highlight this because I want y'all to remember. He says, Tell ye, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and setting upon an ass, and a coat, the foal of an ass. Now, let's read Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the foal of an ass. Okay, now we're going to get the context. Unlike the other so-called Masonic prophecies, Zechariah 99 may be one of the few that was indeed intended to refer to the coming Messiah. That is, that it was fulfilled by Jesus is also fairly certain. All four of the Gospels recorded the event with wholly minor, dis, only minor discrepancies. Matthew has Jesus riding on two animals. Remember up here? A coat and an ass. Matthew has Jesus riding on two animals. Evidently, he misread the Septuagint version of Zechariah 9 and 9. Thus, if we assume that the Gospels are accurate, we can fairly confident we can be fairly confident that this prophecy was in fact fulfilled by Jesus, if we assume that. But we have to ask, how did people used to travel back then? On asses and donkeys. Did they use trains or planes? What were their means of transportation? Since horses and chariots was relatively expensive, then only the rich could afford them. But donkeys were the transportation mode of the poor. Having this in mind, we can be certain that many thousands of common people also entered Jerusalem on donkeys. 
they too fulfill this unique Masonic prophecy? Huh. What about pierced on the cross? We're going to use Zechariah and we're going to go with John. Christians truly believe what happened to Jesus was written about him in the scriptures. When a soldier thrust his lance into Jesus on the cross. John 19 and 37, and again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12 and 10, I will pour out the house of David on the inhabitants. I will pour out the house of David on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and petition. And they shall look upon him whom they have thrust through, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they shall grieve over him as one grieves over a firstborn. Now, the context. It sounds true, but all it takes is to read a few more verses. Zechariah chapter 12. On that day, the morning in Jerusalem shall be as great as the morning of Hadad, Rimon, in the plain of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn each family apart, the family of the house of David and their wives, the family of the house of Nathan and their wives, the family of the house of Levi and their wives, the family of the house of Shimei and their wives, and all the rest of the families, each family apart and the wives apart. In these verses, it is the Jews themselves who will be mourning the one whom their enemies have thrust their weapons through. But in the case of JC, it was the exact opposite. According to the New Testament, it was the Jews who were plotting to kill JC all along. So how could they have mourned over him? Even Christians want Jesus to be crucified in order to take away their sins. It turns out that nobody mourned this man. So how could Christians claim a fulfilled prophecy? This prophecy was not talking about this man, J.C. of Nazareth. Now let's look at Christ's crucifixion. We're going to use Psalms 22 and Mark. 15 and 34. We're going to start with Mark. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them. What every man should take, and that and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroys the temple and builds it in three days. Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking, saying, said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, Let's look at Psalm 22 and verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, Psalm 22 and 7, verse 8. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head. The ad. They, they shake the, the head. <clears throat> saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him let him de deliver him seeing he delighted in him Psalms 22 verse 22 uh, 16 to 18 for dogs have come past me the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me they pierced my hands and my feet they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, watch the context. Psalms 22 is another favorite passage 
that apologists would oft, will often point out to as a fulfillment of prophecy. This is a little curious, however, because nowhere in the Psalms does the author give any indication at all that he is predicting the future. On the face of it, this psalm is another prayer for deliverance like Psalms 28, 30, and 35. As with most of David's deliverance psalms, this song follows the same structure. First, the author recounts his present distress and pleads for divine help. The psalms then ends with a song of rejoicing and praise to God. This is what the story is all about. What can we say about the Christian interpretation of this psalm as a prophecy of J.C.? of Jesus' crucifixion. First, we should note that the Psalms nowhere actually mentions the act of crucifixion. This is not too surprising since this form of execution was not known in David's time. Huh? Crucifixion was not even known in David's time. The closest that we can come in verse 16, which states that they pierced my hands and feet. This phrase actually still does not refer to crucifixion. There is no mention, for example, of nails or a cross. Since the author mentioned dogs in this same verse, he was obviously referring to animal bites. What about the parting of the clothes in verse 18? In fact, this was actually standard practice for an executed criminal. The psalmist is no doubt telling us that his enemies already considered him dead. That Jesus was executed as a criminal is also stated in the gospel. We should not therefore be too surprised that this ex his executioners divided his clothes among themselves. They probably did the same with the other two thieves that were crucified with him. Now, if the Christian interpretation is to hold, one wonders how verse 10 is to be resolved. The psalmist here states that God was with him from the moment of his birth. This makes sense for a purely human protagonist, but it, it is hard to reconcile with the notion of a pre-existent divine Messiah. To sum it up, then we have several problems. First, there is no indication that this psalm was intended to be prophetic. It follows the theme and structure of a number of David's other songs of deliverance. Second, the psalm does not refer to crucifixion in the first place. There are other interpretations which better fit the context of the poem. Finally, there are elements of the psalm that cannot easily be applied to J.C. The bottom line is that this is simply one more Old Testament passage that was taken out of context by the New Testament writers. Now, y'all remember the vinegar drink on the cross? We're going to use Psalms 69 and John 19. Starting with John. After this, aware that everything was now finished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. Now, Psalms 69 and 22. <clears throat> Instead, they put gall in my food. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar. Now, the context. Now, this sounds true, so let's read few, a few more verses as well. Psalm 69, 23, and 29. Make their own table a snare for them, a trap for their friends. Make their eyes so dim they cannot see. Keep their backs ever feeble. Pour out your wrath upon them. Let the fury of your anger overtake them. Make their camp desolate. With, one, with none to dwell in their tents, for they pursued the one you struck, added to the pain of the one you wounded, 
Add that to their crimes. Let them not attain to your reward. Strike them from the book of the living. Do not count them among the just. The psalmist is asking God to blind his enemies, to make their camps desolate, to add iniquity to their iniquity, and to blot them out of the book of life. Now, if the psalmist was talking about a future Christ figure, then how can Christians explain the difference in the attitude he displayed toward his enemies and the one that Jesus displayed to his? It seems strange indeed that God would have chosen a person as spiteful and vengeful as this man to serve as a prophetic figure for the forgiving Jesus. Everyone knows the famous spirit of forgiveness that Jesus demonstrated before and during his crucifixion. Yet this Christ figure that the psalmist was referring to was quite the opposite. Furthermore, the plaint of this distressed psalmist included also in the same verse that mentioned the vinegar as a reference to gall that he was given for meat when he was hungry. So if it was necessary for Jesus to be given vinegar on the cross in order to fulfill this prophecy, shouldn't they have given him the gall too? How could half the verse be a prophecy and the other half not? <clears throat> this is the kind of stuff that we miss when we read these New Testament lies. And it's not hard to spot them if you really study the Torah first. If you've got to go to the New Testament, study the Torah first so that way you can spot these lies. Psalms 34 and 20 and John 19 and 33. Bones not broken. Y'all remember that. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Now, Psalms 34 and 20. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Now, let's look at the context. The first point to note about this particular prophecy is that it does not actually fit the quotation of Psalm 34 and 20. At best, it can be said to be a paraphrase of this verse. The possibility exists that John was appealing to a prophecy that is not preserved in the Hebrew Bible. As strange as it sounds, this is not the first time that John did such a thing. John 7 and 38, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Here we find John quoting a scripture which has no counterpart in the Old Testament, although it does correctly describe water from his purest bladder. Nevertheless, for the purpose of this analysis, we will assume that John was indeed referring to Psalm 34 and 20. If this is the case, a quick look at the context will be enough to dispel any illusions of a Masonic prophecy. Psalms 34 contrasts two groups of people, the righteous and the wicked. It is in this context that verse 20 appears as one of the benefits of being righteous. Psalms 34, 17 through 20. The righteous cry and the Lord hear it and deliver them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. He kept his, all his bones, not one of them is broken. It should therefore be obvious that verse 20 is not directed to one individual, but is in fact directed to a group of people. The righteous. There is no indication at all in this psalm that the author is talking about the Messiah who was to come many centuries later. If Christians insist that verse 20 is a Masonic prophecy, they must also concede that there must be many messiahs. According to the context, 